Good morning. Good morning. I was uh, visiting earlier with uh, Bishop Catherine and thinking about how to prepare for today, and I was, was reminded of, of the fact that uh, I'm the son of a Baptist preacher. He died a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, so I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. My father was a pastor of a church called Mount Canaan Baptist Church, and you would expect that as a child, I would be in Sunday school all the time. And so when I was thinking about our moment of silence, again, I was thinking about what it meant to be a child in the church. And you start to read, I was in, it was in my primary class with Miss Roberta Green, a teacher. And she didn't have formal education, but she would have our, us as little children, six and seven years old, to read the scriptures. So the first scripture where I remember us reading was, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And so after we would read that, she would say, now what did you get out of that little Irvin? My last name, she would call us. But what she was expecting from us was to begin to think about ourselves critically, critical thinking. And while she may not have known about all the physics that we will talk about today, the science, the journey of the universe, she knew that she was a part of something larger than herself, and that I, too, was a part of that, that we were all a part of this story. And that's what I think is a great way for us to think about today's panel, is this journey that we're all on, and using the beginner's mind. So why don't we start with our first guest, I'm going to introduce each one of them first, then we'll be followed by their presentation. So if you can just hold your applause, and I know you would like to applaud right after hearing their bios, but let me do this first. We have Kenneth Kimmel, who is the president of the Union of Concerned Scientists, a leading science-based nonprofit that combines the knowledge and influence of the scientific community with a passion of concerned citizens to build a healthy planet and a safer world. After being trained as an attorney, he has had more than 30 years of experience in government, environmental policy, and advocacy. He's a national advocate for clean energy and transportation policies and a driving force behind UCS's Power Ahead campaign to build a large and diverse group of clean energy states. He serves on the Commission on the Future of Transportation and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We also have with us Bishop Catherine Jefferts Shorey, who serves as the presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church of the United States from 2006 to 2015. Her first career was as an oceanographer after earning her doctorate in that field at the University of Oregon. She later attended seminary and held various positions within the Episcopal Church, including service as the ninth bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Nevada. She was the first woman elected as a primate in the Anglican Communion. And then finally, we have Mary Evelyn Tucker, who with her husband, John Allen Grimm, the co-founder and co-director of the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale University. She teaches in the Joint Master's Program in Religion and Ecology at Yale between the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the Department of Religious Studies. She is the author and or editor of close to 20 volumes and has published hundreds of stories, hundreds of articles. She's widely regarded as a pioneer in the field of religion and ecology. Along with Brian Thomas Swim and John Grimm, she created Journey of the Universe an Emmy winning award, uh, Emmy award winning film, a book from Yale Press, and a series of 20 conversations with scientists and environmentalists. So now you can give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Ken, so why don't you start us off? Uh, we'll hear from you, and then we'll have a brief discussion, and we'll be followed by uh, the bishop and Mary Ellen. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what a delight and what an absolute pleasure to be here with you at this wonderful occasion. Um, I want to thank Owsley and Sarah and all the people who organized this wonderful conference, and I am certainly honored to be sharing a stage with, with such luminaries. So this is, this is a great pleasure. 
Now, all over the world, there are conversations between people of science and people of faith. And those conversations give me hope because we know that science and religion are the most powerful forces of progress that humanity has ever known. And integrating science and faith, having them work hand in hand, is the only way that we are going to address the most existential challenge we face, which is the challenge of runaway climate change. As all of you know, the hour is now very, very late. We're literally running out of time. And nature is sending us an unmistakable signal on a scale resembling the plagues from the book of Exodus. Record-breaking hurricanes every hurricane season. 500-year floods that are happening spaced out months apart. Deadly heat waves, uncontrollable forest fires, and the inexorable rise of the seas. So we have decades left, and I want to underline that word, decades. Decades before parts of our world become unrecognizable. Decades before our children and our grandchildren will look back at the world we have now as a lost Eden. So the question for today is, will we listen to this warning? Will we act? And will we do it? now while we still have time. The future of God's creation, the future of this planet, depends upon the answers to those questions. So there's three points I would like to make uh, in my remarks today. One is that while the hour is late, the world's best minds have figured out how we can prevent runaway climate change. There is a vision and there's a plan. Point two, that plan is mostly relying upon technologies and solutions that we already have, and it's a matter really of scaling up the political will and the courage to do them. And point three, as representatives of the world's religions, you have a critical role to play in scaling these solutions up, perhaps the most critical one. So what is this vision? How do we get there? Broadly, it is a vision of harnessing technologies that we have and some that we need to come up with, in addition to committed, mobilized citizens, to wean ourselves off of polluting sources of energy, and even to remove some of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere now to remove them. It's a vision that allows wealthier countries to continue to maintain and grow uh, and enjoy their standards of living. But it's also a vision that allows poorer countries to enjoy that prosperity as well. Not by making the mistakes of their more developed neighbors and addicting themselves to fossil fuels, but rather leapfrogging over them, much the way that countries now are not using landlines, not building landlines, they're using cell phones. Now some people call this deep decarbonization um, but that focuses really on what we're against. So I think we should pick a name that talks about what we are for. We're for a clean world economy. So how do we get there? As a starting point, let's start with where we are. And I'm going to talk just for a moment about the Paris Agreement, the agreement that uh, in 2016 virtually every country of the world came to an agreement to, and it has a goal of holding the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. So that's the goal, and the agreement contains not just goals, but pledges by almost all the world's uh, countries to take actions on their own to get us towards that. So let's, let's look at this a little bit. Um, that baseline that you see is where we would be at, where scientists predict we'll be at, if uh, we do nothing more, if we just continue along the trajectory we're on. And you can see 
that's a baseline of a three to four degree centigrade temperature increase. That's a world that none of us want to leave behind for our kids or our grandkids. Now at the bottom of the gray, the shading, is approximately where we would get to under the Paris Agreement if every country that made its pledge did what it said it was going to do and did it on time. And you can see oh, there's a lot of progress that gets us under a three degree increase. But the sobering reality is this. We have a very long way to go to meet the two degrees, and it's very much worth remembering two degrees is not the goal. Two degrees is the guardrail. That's when we start being in the danger zone. So we've actually got to do better than two degrees. So we have a long way to go in a very uh, short amount of time. And essentially, to get to that goal of holding the world temperatures to below two degrees, we have to dramatically lower our emissions worldwide. Um, every 10 years that we take to get to net zero reduces the chance of holding that temperature goal. And this graph uh, shows that. So worldwide, we need to be at net zero by about 2060. But of course, we need to recognize that not all countries are in the same position to meet those goals. And so if we want the world to hit net zero by 2060, it is absolutely incumbent upon countries like the United States and Europe that have enjoyed the prosperity uh, associated with fossil fuels that are responsible for most of the emissions and that have the technology and the resources, they've got to do it faster. So the goal here in the United States needs to be net zero by 2050. Now to get to net zero, I want to draw a distinction between two potential ways of getting there. One is a bridge. One is a stepping stone. A bridge would be a, a, a something we would design now with a destination in mind of net zero. And we would try to put this bridge together in such a way that it has a reasonable chance of hitting net zero. Now I want to contrast that with what we've been doing so far, which is a stepping stone approach, where we do incremental policies they move us in the right direction, but they don't necessarily get us all the way. And I'll give you an example. If we uh, retire coal plants and we replace those plants with natural gas, that's a stepping stone. It does get us closer to that goal, but it's not going to get us to net zero. And what happens with a stepping stone approach is eventually it doesn't get us the way we have to go. So, We've got to build a bridge, not stepping stones. And the bridge has five pieces, and I'll go through each one. Um, the first is energy efficiency. That's using energy as efficiently as we can. It's things like LED light bulbs, appliances that use much less energy, uh, fuel economy standards, so cars get more miles per gallon, it's thermostats, it's uh, living in more dense situations rather than having sprawl. So there's many, many different ways of achieving energy efficiency. And the good news in the United States is we've actually done a rather good job of becoming more efficient. This is a chart that shows you that our energy usage in the United States peaked in about 2007, yet our economy is continuing to grow. The other good news is we put thousands and thousands of people to work, weatherizing homes, retrofitting buildings. These are jobs that can't be outsourced, and we've saved money. It hasn't cost us money. We've saved money by becoming more energy efficient. So you might ask, if energy efficiency is so great, why aren't we doing more of it? And this, the best answer I can give you is uh, energy efficiency is boring. It's not a shiny gadget. It's not a snazzy new technology. So all of us need to make energy efficiency not boring. We need to highlight the virtue of saving energy and using that as a way to heal the planet. So that's the first piece of the bridge. The second piece of the bridge is to take the carbon out of our electricity generation. And again, the good news is here we have options. 
We have three big picture options. We're probably going to need all of them. One is uh, a massive scale up of renewables, solar, wind, hydroelectric, energy storage. Uh, there has been a miraculous decrease in the price of solar and wind energy to the point now where it is competitive in many parts of the country with fossil fuels. So that is uh, an excellent development. We probably can't rely upon uh, renewables to get us all the way. Um, so we're going to also need to uh, preserve uh, our capacity, our nuclear power capacity. And we probably will need to have some uh, fossil fuel plants that are built that can capture and sequester the carbon they emit. And the good news here is we're going in the right direction. Um, this is new US power capacity in the United States. You'll see in 2015 and 2016, mm -hmm. solar and wind are, are winning. So that's uh, really strong, something we should be happy about, something that we can accelerate with policies that we already have in place in many states. Things like putting a price on carbon, cl national clean energy standards, tax credits, investment in infrastructure. None of it is rocket science. We can do it right now. And the beauty of getting the carbon out of our electric sector is then we can run a lot of things on clean electricity. The most obvious being our cars and our buses and our trucks. This is a picture of a solar panel collecting the sun's energy, converting it to electricity, and charging a car. I would submit to you that this kind of trifecta is the new divine. This is, this is the vision that we need to strive for. And again, some good news. The price of batteries is falling. That's making uh, it possible for people to buy electric cars that can go for an adequate distance. Um, the biggest challenge with electrifying transportation is getting the cost down. So we've got to continue to uh, make cars and buses and trucks uh, affordable. And we've got to solve the problem uh, for people who don't have garages and easy ways to charge up their cars. But again, this is not a matter of coming up with some new technology. This is really about political will, and we can do this. The fourth piece is to use nature as our friend to remove as much carbon as possible. We all know from elementary school that trees do a wonderful job of absorbing carbon dioxide. So in the United States uh, today, uh, about 10% of our carbon emissions are offset by forests. We're gaining forestry about a million acres a year. If we doubled or tripled that amount, just to bring forested levels back to where they were in 1850, it's estimated that we could offset about 45% of our emissions. But it's also true worldwide especially that the trend line on forests is going in the wrong direction towards deforestation rather than gaining. And so we are going to need technologies that can take carbon out of the atmosphere, as strange as that may sound. And that's going to require two things. One, we have to think about carbon differently, not as a waste material, but as a resource. And two, we need a massive worldwide public and private partnership to come up with the technologies that can do this cost effectively. We've done this before. We've done it with, with the moon launch. We've done it with many human endeavors. I have no doubt that if we set our sights on finding a way to remove carbon from the atmosphere and use it beneficially, we can do that. And that brings us to the last piece of the bridge, which is it's not just carbon dioxide that we have to worry about. There are non-CO2 gases, some of which are actually more powerful in trapping heat than carbon. Things like methane that comes from oil and gas extraction operations and from agriculture. Mm -hmm. Things like hydrofluorocarbons that come from refrigerators and air conditioning. And fortunately, there are answers to all of these types of gases as well. The technology is there. So those are the five sections of the bridge. Many economists have costed this out, and there's a range of estimates. 
but they generally are in the 1% of world GDP per year to do this. So let me see a show of hands. How many of you would put it 1% of your income in order to save this world from disaster? I think everybody. You are next. You are next. You are, yeah, you were right. So there's the vision. There's the plan. We can afford it. So, where do you come in? Helen Keller once said, science may have found a cure for most evils, but it has found no remedy for the worst of them all, the apathy of human beings. Religion is the antidote to apathy. Religion draws people together to a higher calling, a more noble purpose. Religion motivates people to confront injustice. And in this case, there is a tremendous intergenerational injustice here of all of us leaving behind a world that's so much worse for our kids and our grandkids. Religion inspires action. Religion encourages stewardship and preservation. And most of all, religion keeps hope alive when the obstacles seem daunting. So what can you do? I would say first, each of you needs to make climate change your number one issue. And I know that's a big ask, because all of you are working on other very important issues, issues of poverty and justice and violence and inequality. And you can't drop all those things. But you have to understand that runaway climate change will make addressing all of those things much, much worse. So make this your priority issue and demand that leaders in this country and worldwide start building that bridge, setting that 2050 net zero goal into law, putting the right people in charge of designing that bridge, having an inclusive public process so all the best ideas about that bridge come to the table, and finding a way to pay for it. And in addition to your political activism, at your own level, there's so much you can do. Have your church or your home buy electricity from carbon-free sources. Put solar panels on your roofs or your churches. Make your next vehicle an electric one or a plug-in. Spend a little more money on the appliances you buy because they will save energy and money in the long run, don't waste food. Cut down on red meat or eliminate it from your diet. Plant trees and donate money to other countries to help them build their bridge. So I want to end uh, by uh, talking a little bit about Dr. Martin Luther King, in part because he's my personal hero, but also because he understood how, the, how important religion is in solving social injustice. And he was asked over and over again, how do you keep going? The odds seem so daunting. And he said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think we all know that to be true and have seen examples of it. But when it comes to climate change, the arc is bending in the wrong direction right now. And it will take the combined power of faith and science to bend that arc down and to build that bridge to a clean energy economy. Let's do that together. Ken, I am left with um a, a, a great sense of optimism, uh, even in the midst of uh, President Trump draw, withdrawing the United States from the Paris Accord. Why are you optimistic? Well, uh, one reason is a pragma pragmatic reason. I have to be. Um, I have to be. My, my job is to try to mobilize and, and make change, and it doesn't help to uh, I, I, I try to talk honestly about the challenge, but I also try to 
indicate that there are solutions. In terms of President Trump, you're right, he's trying to pull us out. He hasn't succeeded. Mm -hmm. There was a, some uh, unbelievable wisdom in the Paris Agreement in that it requires a full four years for a country to pull out. I see. And the first effective date that we could actually pull out <laughs> So there, there, I happens see. to be the day after the election. I see. <laughs> so we're not out of the Paris Agreement. We're not. But you also spoke about, um, you have also spoken at other places about the role that you've noticed by uh, CEOs, uh, corporate yep. leaders. Talk a little bit about that as well. I will, because there's a lot of things that give me hope, uh, and, and one of them is the business community that has mm -hmm. uh, organized and, and taken it upon themselves to tell the rest of the world that while Mr. Trump may want to pull out of Paris and turn back the clock, um, the business community is still in this fight, and so you see uh, companies buying 100% of their electricity mm -hmm. from renewable sources, investing mm -hmm. in energy efficiency, mm -hmm. investing billions of dollars in uh, technology development, and starting, although I think they have a long way to go, starting to be uh, an advocacy force as well. But, mm -hmm. I, but I do want to say they have a ways to go because if, you, if they come to Washington and they lobby a senator or a congressman, you'll see about 10 issues that they want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Climate change is, is about 10th. Still, it still needs, still to be, needs to be first. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're actually walking the walk. Mm -hmm. They're not yet talking the talk. Mm -hmm. Bishop Catherine, what do you think uh, from your perspective? Uh, this, I, I was intrigued by a scientist, of course you're a scientist as well, in gauging, asking the church to be a part of a, quote, secular kind of thing. What do you think about well, that? It's, it's not secular. As, as you noted in your introductory mm -hmm. remarks, um, the, the creation is where the Bible starts. Mm -hmm. um, unless we are in relationship with what gives life, mm -hmm. uh, we're not being faithful people. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of examples right now of faith communities challenging their members mm -hmm. to um, eat less red meat, mm -hmm. uh, um, to fast from mm -hmm. meat. That's an ancient spiritual tradition. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Diocese of California has challenged all the Episcopal churches there mm -hmm. um, to put solar on their roofs. Mm -hmm. And they're close to having done that wow. for every congregation in the wow. diocese. So we, we are beginning to engage mm -hmm. in very uh, concrete ways at the, at the family level, at the household level, at the faith community level, at the larger judicatory level. Mm -hmm. And we're advocating in Washington. Wonderful. So. Mary Evelyn, we're gonna hear from you um, in just a moment, but before you start, how does this fit within your concept of us telling a new story? Is that, does that feel like we're starting to tell a new story? Yes, thank you, and thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, definitely because all the religions um, are participating in this sense that science is giving us a story of evolution. Mm -hmm. That story is not just a meaningless story. Mm -hmm. It's a story that situates us in a place of creation place, but for all the religions, a place of meaning, of purpose, of engagement, of matter matters. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can get a glimpse mm -hmm. that we matter in that context mm -hmm. of a extraordinary gift mm -hmm. of a 14 billion year unfolding universe. Mm -hmm. That is exciting, that's empowering, and that gives, I think, the inspiration for the perspiration on the ground. Wonderful, well, I guess this is a great time for you to, um, to take the stage and lead us into this journey into the universe. Please Thank welcome. You. So last night we did speak about Journey of the Universe, and today I'm going to be speaking more specifically about the role of the world's religions uh, that Ken so beautifully pointed to. Now, we have clearly a growing climate change awareness, but the action is still coming forward, as Ken just said. So what is missing? So we need to think about how science and policy and ethics can line up. University of Concerned Scientists is one of the best places on the planet for doing this. But to leverage transformation, we have to find the acupuncture points of change, 
In other words, we have the science, we even have the policy, but getting this ethical and spiritual mix um, is into the, the future. So we want to acknowledge from the very beginning, as an audience like this would understand, religions have their problems and their promise. But what we've tried to do with hundreds of scholars and activists and scientists uh, like Ed Wilson and Peter Raven and others is help to create a field within education where religion and ecology can come forward. How do these traditions contribute to our major problems right now? But this larger force that many of you are participating in, grassroots, religious environmentalism, Catherine just referred to them, interfaith power and light, uh, changing your carbon footprint and so on. So this field and force is the context of my talk here. Um, Religion and ecology as a field has been growing for 20 years. There's jobs in universities now, even high schools are teaching this, which is kind of astonishing um, how rapidly this has come forward. The People's Climate March in New York in 2014, hopefully some of you were there, it was extraordinary. Um, and that has really led the, the moment when the force was visible in terms of 10,000 religious leaders were there. Now, education and outreach is one of the most important things we can do. Um, and that's what this field and force is trying to combine. I want to just tell you how I got into this. I went to Japan in 73, 74, rather disillusioned in the late 60s and so on. Um, and here's Mount Fuji, the icon of Japan, if you will. But here's also the reality in Japan. Um, and many of those industries went overseas, as we know, from Japan. China, when I first went there in 85, beautiful. Even the cities were remarkable. People riding bikes. Um, now, we have immensely polluted rivers, cities, and so on. So this sense, those of us in Asian studies, I did my PhD in Asian religions, especially China and Japan, we became alarmed. And so we did this project at Harvard for three years, trying to study all of the world's religions with, as I say, hundreds of scholars and environmentalists working on this to say, Environmental ethics are going to look different in China, in India, or Africa than our Western Christian uh, and Jewish Islamic traditions. So we did these conferences and published these books. Um, we then created a forum on religion and ecology uh, at a UN conference. A thousand people came the next day to the Natural History Museum because the scientists there, Mike Novacek in particular, gave us the IMAX theater rent-free. Bill Moyers interviewed the religious leaders saying we need this kind of combination. So in 2006, Gus Beth, a tremendous uh, environmentalist and climate change person, brought us to Yale because he said after years of doing the science and policy and law and so on. We need the values, we need the ethics. Um, so we're in a science-based school at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, but trying to bring this uh, religious, ethical, moral force uh, within a very complicated place, I might say. Um, <laughs> so we also created a website, which I hope will be useful for all of you here. We're about to do a new version of it, but it has bibliographies of the world's religion, their sacred texts, statements by religious leaders, and engaged projects on the ground, and we want to add more from Louisville. I'm sure there's more that uh, we might not have. There's a special section on so the science of climate change and the ethics and news articles. It's just exploded in 20 years, um, this, this uh, field and this force. There's also educational resources, a newsletter, which we're happy to have you uh, join. And again, we want to feature your projects and so on. We definitely want to have uh, UCS in a new uh, newsletter soon. <clears throat> so over the last almost 20 years, we've been doing conferences on this topic, um, beginning with the Daedalus volume at Harvard. All of that's online and so on. Um, so both international and national conferences. Again, I come back to this moment in 2014 um, where people told us at the UN as they were negotiating um, these, these very difficult climate talks, they said they were watching the people on the street. And I think we should just pause for a moment to really give it up for Greta Thornburg, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And 
they call them children, but I think you, and I'm so thrilled to know so many of, of high schools and grammar schools are here, the young people are truly leading the way. The action, leaving schools, and so on. Let's give it up. Fantastic. Fantastic. We have your backs. <laughs> I like to say an intergenerational handshake, and that's what we want to be involved with, with you all. So let me also just note the leadership has really emerged. Pope Francis, I'm going to speak about him in a few more moments. His good friend, the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew of the Greek Orthodox Church, these had been leaders on these issues. I had this slide before even this talk, but <laughs> here she is. <laughs> and she's better in person. <laughs> Joel Hunter has been doing this work for the evangelical communities, along with many others. We have active climate change groups, again right here in our midst, Interfaith Power and Light, Green Faith, um, and Catholic Climate Covenant. As we all know, we love the Dalai Lama, and he has been speaking on religion, ecology, climate change for a long, long time. But he has others in his community, and Many of you are practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism. The 17th Karmapa, an extraordinary young person, just in his early 30s, he has 55 monasteries working on climate change across the Himalaya region, which is one of the greatest areas at risk for the melting of the glaciers and so on. You know, there are literally a billion people depending on those glaciers from the Himalayas across um, South Asia. So this work is absolutely critical. We have American engaged Buddhists. Many of you know these magnificent people. Um, Gary Snyder and Joanna Macy are kind of leading the list, but so many have been working on this as well. Now, when we come to education, we could give many examples, but because I'm going to come back to the Pope, and he happens to be Jesuit, um, the Jesuit schools have really put in place uh, a lot of work because of the papal encyclical. So conferences, but um, curriculum, and so on. Loyola University in Chicago has a biodiesel program. They've got a sustainability master's program and undergraduate program. So the educational partners just of the Jesuits, 28 universities here, but 230 around the world, and then the secondary schools as well. One of the largest educational groups in the world doing this education on climate change, on ecology, and so on. In particular, they have this online textbook called Healing Earth, which you can get the science and the ethics. Unprecedented. You see, even at Yale, we can't put that together in that same way. But the science of these various issues, what is our moral response? The most vulnerable, as we know, around the world are suffering. In South Asia, but Katrina in our own country, Sandy, and so on, who are the ones most affected? Those least responsible. So the papal encyclical, I want to highlight this because it is one of the most extraordinary uh, documents of our time. You all know Bill McKibben, I'm sure, who founded 350.org, and he says, after coming to Yale a year ago at breakfast the next morning, he said, Mary Evelyn, the most important document of the 21st century is the encyclical. Now, he's written more books, blurred more books, read more books than most of us in this room. Um, Dan Esty at our school went to Paris, and before he went to Paris, he was like, oh, I'm not sure if the Pope gets cap and trade and so on. I'm like, that's not quite the point, Dan, <laughs> even though he's a great policy person. He came back in January, held up the encyclical at a panel, and said, this is why we got an agreement in Paris. Pretty amazing. Now, why? Because the encyclical is an invitation to what our teacher Thomas Berry spoke about years ago, an integral ecology, people and the planet. So our school of forestry is working on the planet, on these ecosystems, divinity school and so on, people, social justice. So putting this together is critical because these various silos of science and religion have not been working well together until fairly recently. Um, so the ethical challenges of climate change are environmental degradation. Creation is being unraveled. Eden no more 
is the title of Tom Lovejoy's new essay on what's happening for biodiversity. You're going to hear about it May 6, because this huge report on biodiversity loss is just coming out. It is staggering. It is heartbreaking, which is why we need the energy of religion to get through this sad, bad news. But ethical forces, as Ken beautifully referred to, are things that do make social change happen, things that do make environmental change happen. I'm very, very inspired by King, the this, this civil rights movement. I was in college in Washington, DC. Nancy Pelosi was there. We were all involved in that, these issues. But it wasn't until the moral force of religions came forward with people like King that change began to happen. And we have a long way to go. But that's where the invitation to festival of faith is so crucial. The leadership of this is amazing. And I think you all can make a difference. Please clap for yourselves. <laughs> <clears throat> So climate justice, how many of you have heard of our children's trust? It's Juliana versus the United States. It's young people, I think there's about 20 of them, which are suing for the f their future. Where's the well-being for future generations? Um, this is critical, just as the young people's uh, movement is as well. Now the audience for the encyclical, um, for in the Christian world, over a billion Catholics, but altogether two billion Christians. This is huge. But other religious communities have responded to the encyclical on our website. We have statements from, from Buddhists, from Confucians, from Hindus, why this integral ecology is so crucial. Um, the goals of the Pope, both long and short term, he wanted to affect the climate change talks in Paris. He did. Um, it was the first visit, as you know, to the US, speaking at the UN General Assembly. Right after he spoke in September 2015, the UN Sustainable Development Goals were passed. Now, of course, there were years of work on that and so on, but it was the moral force with the practical action. What are our development goals going forward? So, I'm going to just kind of summarize um, here. The religions of the world and ecology, along with science, policy, technology, law, new economics, religions of the world and ecology are one of the most important acupuncture points for change. They penetrate to the chi of our spirit, of our sources of inspiration for the perspiration, as I said before. Now, why then is this field in force something that we can have hope around with all of the difficulties, with all of the obstacles? I go back and forth to Asia a great deal, and let me tell you, our problems look small when you look at Chinese cities of literally 30 million people dealing with some of these issues. And yet, Confucian values, Taoist values and Buddhist values, they've translated the Harvard Conference books back into Chinese and so on. They're trying to use these values. So let me summarize here. Cultural values and ethics matter. We know that. And that's why it's so important to have the alliance with scientists um, who get that too. We have incredible educational establishments, I've named a few, who can make this difference. You have your Louisville Seminary and other universities right here. Um, I haven't said much about investment and divestment, but this is really growing. You know, socially responsible investment in many ways began with the pension funds of the religious communities to say, we don't want to invest in war, in, in tobacco, in violent, uh, in guns and so on. So investment, into new energies, divestment from fossil fuels. The churches are, are moving forward on this. Um, leadership and outreach. We have Catherine with us today. We have amazing people who can speak to this and transform the hearts and minds of people. It is perhaps one of our, not last, but one of our greatest hopes for leadership, and that includes laity. It's not just the people in the pulpit or in the uh, 
the, where, where rabbis and imams might sit, it's the whole congregation. So let me end with this point of resilience and inspiration. You know, we're trying to figure ways that we can restore ecosystems, rebuild these systems, which some people will say they have ecosystem services for humans, uh, wetlands, and so on. But these are more than just in service for humans, because in our restoration of these ecosystems, we are restoring something of ourself, which is why it was so beautiful last night to begin with facing the river. Why is Louisville here? The river, right? Why is Louisville here? The blue grasses, <laughs> the things that we need to sustain over time. So let me just conclude by saying, resilience, restoration, and inspiration. With these alone and much more, we can change our planet in this critical moment. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Mary Ellen. I have a couple of questions um, just to start us off for a brief conversation. Talk a little bit about, I, I think I was struck by um, the perspective almost, the, the, the shareholder versus the stakeholder, the idea of the short term versus the long term. And I think that it would be fair to say that the problem we're trying to solve for is a long term problem. And then we are faced with um, financial leaders, the business community, which you alluded to a little bit, who is more focused on the short term, right. the shareholder. And of course, we know that there is a lot of discussion about that. How about exploring a little bit about why are you optimistic about there's some movement among economists about the way we're thinking about capitalism to sort of expand the time uh, horizons and uh, in, that, in, in, in that context. Thank you for that question, Nat, uh, so important. So there's a whole new field called ecological economics, and one of the interviews in Journey of the Universe that I do is with Richard Norgard, who helped found that field, saying the externalities of nature cannot be ignored for profit. People, planet, profit. Mm -hmm. I was just having lunch um, with the marketing division of the Connecticut Green Bank, mm -hmm. who is trying precisely to work through these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and they are moving out of the conventional forms mm -hmm. of profit, fourth uh, quarterly earnings, and so on. Let me also say, since um, the business community was mentioned, insurance mm -hmm. is coming mm -hmm. to the table mm -hmm. in huge ways. Mm -hmm. My brother's head of Chubb Insurance in New York, we have been talking about this for 20 years. Just. Uh, ten days ago, the head of Chubb Insurance, Evan Greenberg, gave to their stockholders a major statement that this is no longer something we are just thinking about on the horizon, obviously because of risk. Mm -hmm. Now, the reinsurance companies like Swiss Re and Munich Re have been holding their yellow flag for some time. But when the companies that are selling you mm -hmm. insurance, mm -hmm. that is when the change will happen. And uh, they are rapidly moving into that space. And when they come to the table, you can't get insurance on Long Island, for example, very easily. Chubb has not insured coastal water properties for years. They're worrying about California. When they come to the table, we have a huge acupuncture point of change. So let's keep pressuring the insurance companies. Can you add to that? Well, I, first of all, I think that acupuncture uh, is, is, a, is a wonderful analogy and, and the idea that you're, you're doing something that has leverage that reaches deep into your soul or is an inflection point for society is, is a wonderful analogy. I do agree that the uh, reinsurers and the insurance industry is a game changer. One of the things we've been doing at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we did an interactive study last year um, showing sea level rise within the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. And you can go to our website and plug in your zip code. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can see, uh, it may not be your home, but it may be your access road or your community. And uh, we chose 30 years because it's in the life of a mortgage. And that's mm -hmm. typically people's biggest in investment. <laughs> um, and so not only is the insurance industry really coming to the table, uh, at the, the, the mortgage mortgage uh, holders are as well, and uh, the 
uh, cities that, that do planning and that have to think about what their communities are going to look like um, are also coming to the table as our municipal bondholders. So they're all doing exactly what you said. They're starting to recognize the risk. They could be a very powerful force. I guess the other one I would add, um, the electric utility industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. needs to understand that when we talk about transportation, it's a battle between oil and electricity. And in order to have our climate goals met, electricity needs to win that battle. So they are another potentially big muscled ally here in the fight. I think what's been missing though is that they talk about these risks, but they don't actually invest their lobbying muscle mm -hmm. to get the solutions. Yeah. That's the next step. Um, and until they do that, we're not going to get where we need to go. Well, I think that's, that, that's a great uh, pivot point because I was going to ask next about um, their protest right now in London. I guess they're over now, but um, on the financial exchange where the glue activists, these are people that have decided to glue themselves to close the exchange. I mean, literally to uh, glue themselves to the building so that um, you, you can't have commerce. Mm -hmm. But when reading some of the comments, the, they have decided, these are the global extinction, I think that's yeah. the, yep. right, yeah. the extinction. They have decided that to target not all business, but to target the financial mm -hmm. services industry. And yeah. I think that's a pretty mm -hmm. uh, substantial tactical error because we would say not all businesses, some businesses are further along and on this journey, Patagonia, for example, yep. a lot that are further along. Um, why don't you all weigh in a little bit on, uh, on that part of the, uh, this equation of getting the economy and the values, but narrowing it in on the financial services industry? Anyone? I, I think it depends on the part of the world you live in. Oh, good. Um, mm -hmm. As a Westerner, mm -hmm. uh, most of the big cities are along the coast mm -hmm. and in the wetlands, um, mm -hmm. in the estuaries. Sea rise, sea rise and erosion mm -hmm. on the far west coast mm -hmm. is a major issue. That's mm -hmm. where most of the people have built their houses. Mm -hmm. That's where most of the cities are. Mm -hmm. uh, the train, the Amtrak, that goes uh, north from San Diego to LA and mm -hmm. farther points north, um, goes through a lovely community called Del Mar. Mm -hmm. um, every week there is news of another collapse of the cliffs the railroad goes right along the cliffs. Oh. Um, it's going to cost billions mm. and billions of dollars to move those Finance. tracks inland. Uh, that's one small but very large example. Transportation is a big mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Great. Yes. I think you're so right to point to this because it, it's again the investment divestment mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. And I participate in a small group that meets several times in New York, several times a year. Mm -hmm. And against all odds, almost curiously, um, our last meeting, uh, it, because it's ethics and finance mm -hmm. is the focus, mm -hmm. and they were taking the encyclical and saying, how wow. can we put this, and these are people sitting there from GE, from Citicorp, from S&P 500, mm -hmm. these, Energy czar for Cuomo in mm -hmm. New York. These are very influential people mm -hmm. who are saying we must make this ethical mm -hmm. shift for mm -hmm. finance, financial mm -hmm. services, and so on. Ken, you want to add anything? No, I, I think that 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 is. I think holding the financial service industry accountable for their investments is a really important strategy. Um, you know, just as one example, there's still an enormous amount of financing in building new coal burning plants in places like Vietnam and, and Indonesia. You know, China started to mm -hmm. export their yeah. coal technology. And, and mm -hmm. so I think um, there's been an effective uh, way in which some of these folks have named names and highlighted yeah. who's, who's actually funding mm -hmm. these, these plants. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's a good arrow in the quiver, an important one. A good part of the acupuncture. <laughs> yeah. Bishop Catherine. Why don't you close this out?
Thank you. I'm glad that Ken started by talking about conversation. That word comes from Latin roots that mean to turn with, to turn with others. When it came into English around the year 1300, it didn't mean using words. It meant spending time with other people. There's a concept in common law, criminal conversation, that means spending too much time with the wrong person. It's not about speech. It's a legal term for adultery. Criminal conversation might also be a fruitful lens for thinking about how our species has abused and harassed and violated Mother Earth. We've often stolen what belongs to the whole community of life, and we've often alienated the particular affection of indigenous peoples for all their life-giving relatives. We're here today in search of deeper conversation among human wisdom traditions. Wisdom is about knowing. The word comes from a root that means to see or to know the way. Wisdom traditions teach ways of knowing and they include the world's great religions as well as the scientific method. These wisdom traditions teach particular ways of knowing. Religious or faith traditions are more often concerned with the meaning of life and how to live a good life. The scientific tradition seeks to understand how things work. Both of them are interested in origins, development, and interconnectedness. They are natural conversation partners, even though they begin with rather different questions. The conversation between faith and science was far more integrated before the Enlightenment. In a time when theology was called queen of the sciences. Rationality has been privileged in recent centuries in ways that have certainly improved our understanding of how the world and the cosmos work yet also in ways that have compromised our appreciation and valuing of diversity and interdependence. Particularly in our American context, we can regularly see four attitudes at least toward conversation between religion and science. The first one insists that the other tradition has nothing to say like public school boards who want to pro prohibit teaching evolution, or the snide remark that something is just a myth or only a theory. Myths are wisdom stories about the origins and the meaning of life. Theories are wisdom stories about how things work or change, and all of them reflect a deep understanding of truth. The second attitude about science and religion acknowledges that the two fields have something to say, but only if they don't intersect. Science teaches how the heavens go. Religion teaches how to go to heaven. <laughs> A third kind of conversation moves beyond mutual incomprehensibility to recognize that both science and religion use metaphor and symbolic or poetic language, and they can be mutually enlightening, particularly at the interesting and edgy boundaries between them, like the soft hair on black holes that retains something of what they've swallowed up. I want to encourage the even deeper mutuality of a fourth way, in which thinking with both hemispheres rational and intuitive, or looking with a scientist's eye and a sacred eye yields far deeper, far greater depth perception. That is one of wisdom's goals. Scientific and religious wisdom traditions have a great deal in common, beginning with the reality that both rely on faith, faith that something is knowable, at least to a degree, 
and faith that practicing the tradition yields reasonably consistent outcomes. Both faith and science are communal activities with habits and disciplines that guide the pursuit of wisdom. Wonder and curiosity drive the passion of both groups. Each looks for truth as well as beauty or elegance. Religion and science <clears throat> look for goodness, understood as consistency, fairness, or justice. Both traditions develop theories and test their knowledge before claiming it as the best truth that can be known at present. That accumulated wisdom is published in oral narratives or in the written scriptures of religion or peer-reviewed journals. Truth is ultimately judged in community where change happens both in the slow accretion of knowledge and sometimes in radical paradigm shifts. Change among human beings is almost always accompanied by resistance and anxiety, and it's far greater when it involves the paradigm shifts of new revelation, like the emergence of Christianity or Islam, or in scientific revolutions, like Einstein's theory of relativity. Reformations can be almost as challenging and bloody. Think about translating scripture into the vernacular or the shift from an earth-centered universe to a cosmic view. Only deep and persistent conversation can eventually produce the necessary conversion of head and heart to another way of relating to the world. Wisdom traditions include broadly defined sources of authority that push us beyond personal idiosyncrasy and that challenge people to amend or renounce earlier understandings in favor of new and deeper wisdom. Religious traditions call that repentance and amendment of life. Scientists call it refining the theory Both assert the need for humility about the limits of knowing. Both science and religion enforce norms of discourse that require communal affirmation of change and growth. Sometimes holding liminal spaces or suspending judgment for a time permit further inquiry. As particle physics wrestles with string theory, or religious groups wrestle with new understandings of human sexual variety. In the present search for wisdom about the changing nature of this planet, we are long past the threshold of truth that's demanded by both wisdom traditions. It's abundantly clear that human activity is disrupting and destroying the life-giving character of this planet and its ability to support the kind of life that has existed here for countless millennia. I'm convinced that conversation is the only thing that leads to conversion of heart, mind, and deed. Our planetary conversation must engage both spheres of inquiry, for we need the best and deepest wisdom about our manner of living and its consequences for all life on this planet. We need the passion of poets and the clinical clarity of scientists, and we need the kind of transformative bridges that both the first two speakers have talk talked about if we and our fellow inhabitants are going to survive. Scientists of varied disciplines have clearly demonstrated the trajectory of a warming earth, shrinking ice cover, rising sea level, intensifying storms, spreading disease, and the growing extinction of species and biomes. Our own species is threatened 
along with many others on whom life depends for breath, food, and nutrient recycling. We have the data, and we understand the mechanisms of global warming, yet all sorts of non-rational responses get in the way of changing how we live. Fear, anxiety, willful blindness, and blatant short-term self-interest prevent us from repenting or turning around and going in a more life-giving direction. Human beings need hope, hope that solutions are possible. We need compassion for suffering neighbors, and on this planet, we are all neighbors. And we need a will to do justice, for we are all in this together. The world's great faith traditions agree on a moral baseline that's usually called the golden rule. Stated positively, it's treat others as you wish to be treated. Different traditions have developed and nuanced that baseline. Two strands of the Judeo-Christian wisdom tradition define the basics as love God with your whole being and love your neighbor as yourself. And do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Loving God, self, or neighbor implies intimate conversation that leads to knowing one's limits and leads to respect for the other. That conversation can help to produce compassion or mercy, which at the level of a community or nation is called justice. The Abrahamic traditions developed in a context where water was precious and settlements were often widely separated and hospitality was understood as the touchstone of a good life. Former slaves were repeatedly reminded not to oppress others, but to care lovingly for those without the resources to sustain their lives, widows and orphans, travelers, migrants, and the poor who didn't have access to farmland or pastures. Faithful people were challenged to care for the least and the lost and the left out. Sabbath rest became a hallmark of those traditions as a counterpoint to slavery. Sabbath rest extended not only to the faithful human beings, but to animals and slaves and visitors and even the land fallowed every seventh year. That wisdom acknowledges and respects the diversity of communities on which life depends. The Jain tradition goes even far farther and teaches radical respect for life, even in the form of filtering one's own breath lest an insect be inhaled and die, and vigilance about walking lest a small creature be crushed awe and wonder at the wild exuberance of life is part of what wisdom traditions teach. Respect and care can grow from that experience of transcendence. Compassion for other lives and forms of life, born of humility that recognizes finitude and interrelatedness, can transform human attitudes, and actions. We may clearly understand the scientific conclusions and the need for amendment of life, but resistance reigns. The will to amend our lives comes in humble and vulnerable conversation with others. Can we be merciful to other species? Can we feel compassion for Pacific Islanders whose homes are literally disappearing beneath the waves? Will we do justice for our children, grandchildren, and neighboring species and generations? 
The language is almost four centuries old, yet John Donne's brief poem points toward that bridging of head and heart, that binding of life to life, and that conversation between planet and living beings. He wrote, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. The bell tolls for the great circle of life on this planet. Seek wisdom to see each living creature as part of one vast whole. Live with wisdom and compassion, caring for every life, and spend your life in conversation toward justice for life on this planet. Bishop Catherine, I, um, I, I, I think uh, I, you, you, were, you were talking about the declaration of interdependence, that we have the declaration of independence, the framework in which the enlightenment and how we find ourselves, and you're challenging us now to begin this journey of interdependence across a wide range of conversations. And we, we're not gonna be able to do it all in this three minutes, but later on, <laughs> I do want us to, I think you have just, yeah. from my mind, you have just said we need to talk about that interdependence. Um, say something. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I love that you say this, because um, we're on the same page here, um, because we do actually have a declaration of interdependence, um, and it's called the Earth Charter. Mm -hmm. It came out of the Rio conference. It took 10 years to write. The beginning is we're part of a vast evolving universe. That's the prologue. Mm -hmm. um, Earth, our home, is alive with a myriad community of life, which was science mm -hmm. and indigenous peoples. I was part of the drafting committee. That was an intentional mm -hmm. coming together. But the three parts of it are ecological integrity, mm -hmm. social economic justice, democracy, nonviolence, and peace. So ecology, justice, and peace mm -hmm. are the three uh, poles mm -hmm. of this interdependence. Mm -hmm. So the good news is the human community has been thinking towards mm -hmm. getting out of hyper-individualism, which has its positive things, but towards a, really a declaration of interdependence. Mm -hmm. And I think we can get behind that mm -hmm. as it moves forward. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for <laughs> your amazingly inspirational words. Um, I, I do think we need a, a, a renewed commitment to inter interdependence. And I think one of the most challenging aspects and where we really need to stretch as humanity is it's not just, even though this is a big one, recognizing that our fates of the current people living on Earth are, are connected, mm -hmm. but to be connecting to future generations. Yeah. Um, and that is really the challenge of climate change, in, in, uh, among other things, because while we are suffering the impacts now, 
um, we're, we're either suffering them directly from extreme weather events or we're paying for, for, for repairs to things. It's really future generations that are gonna bear the brunt and, and, and the, 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 the challenge for humanity is, is, to, is to somehow realize that what we do now it determines the fate of future generations. And for me, I, I, I think the, the best way to imagine that is to think about my kids and my grandkids and their grandkids because that's very personal to me. I think mm -hmm. it's hard for people to think about 2100 and mm -hmm. the polar ice caps melting, but right, right. they can think about their grandkids or their great grandkids. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, the kind of thinking it's gonna take to get to that level of interdependence. But it's it's a, it's a it as you pointed out it, it's it's a massive challenge and again I come back to what I said I think it's more religion than science that's going to get us to think in those terms uh, science can provide the facts we can provide the what but it I think it's religion and spirituality that provides the why. Kathy, yes. <laughs> One more question for Catherine before we have Sarah to come up and bring some of our students. But Catherine, a little bit more about, um, which I loved, um, the, the, the notion of repentance among scientists. Yeah. You know, they just never repent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know they do, but, uh, but I thought that was a wonderful yes. way of uh, Ken's nodding because they don't, right? <laughs> but uh, a wonderful way of combining uh, it made me think about Copernicus and about uh, what that would require of people within the faith community and the science community to say, wait a minute, we've got this whole thing wrong. That, but that, at, at the heart of that is humility, whether you're a scientist or in the faith community. Isn't that a little bit about kind of what you were saying there? Yes, I, I think that we don't change until we recognize something that needs to be altered. Um, and it is, I think, the, the religious impulse that, that challenges our arrogance. Mm -hmm. um, there are many ways to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, there is always possibility for change and growth. And I think it's the invitation into that without humiliating people, yeah. mm -hmm. but reminding us that we are creatures of the earth, mm -hmm. ultimately. We'll come back, okay? We're gonna to to come back to that. Sarah, come on up. We like to take a little stretch halfway through the program, and we're a little over halfway, but um, we're gonna turn on the house lights. Everyone, if you could stand for a minute, and then we're gonna hear um, an announcement from a young group of students at Iroquois High School. All right, if we could be seated. We're about to have a really inspiring presentation by the group Futurum from Iroquois High School. And to introduce them is Yeni Izquierda. My name is Jennifer Coca. I am from Cuba, and I am the future. My name is Catherine Socias. I am from Cuba. Yo soy el futuro. My name is Malki Okoika. I am from the Ara Congo. Je suis le futur. My name is Kim Gun. I come from Vietnam. Chum do la tung lai. My name is Merlin. I'm from Guatemala. Je soy el futuro. My name is Kao. I'm from Vietnam. Chum do la tung lai. My name is Lisbeth. I'm from Cuba. Je soy el futuro. Futura means future in Latin. We decided to use a Latin word because we all speak different languages. Futura is a very diverse team. We represent six nations in four different continents which are uniting to advocate for teen immigrants and refugees. The team decided to focus on similarities to integrate, celebrate, and to protect immigrants' rights in Louisville. Here's an important data about Kentucky. Um, Louisville is on track to join the top 50 cities in the United States with a for foreign-born and resident population. Also, the Iroquois High School is the most diverse high school in Kentucky with over 54 languages spoken.
We created a survey for ESL students at Iroquois High School to see what problems they face as newcomers here in this country. 74% uh, said uh, one of the main uh, problems they have is English, learning English. 15% uh, of them concerned about the post-secondary education. For example, how to get financial aid to pay for college. Uh, the last problem we have is the 11% with the basic need. Many immigrants concerned about how to get green card, food stamp for their families. Based on the results from the survey, we decided to create a Futurum Teen Immigrant Forum in which we invited different community leaders and students from the Newcomer Academy, which is a school designed for newcomers who have just arrived in Kentucky. The students took part in different activities in, this, in which they generated questions for the panelists. Community leaders were also asked to bring information about services available in the community. Here it is a video about our community and we want to share this one with you all. to continue Futurum the years to come. Our principal has already agreed on continuing Futurum as a club in order to help our students integrate in their community and their school. We also want to maintain our contact with our community leaders, and we hope that by being here, we can represent our immigrant community. Thank you. Uh, we're so thankful for all of our community partners for helping us in the forum, and we're especially thankful for our coaches, Ms. Niri and Ms. Len, for believing in us and for supporting us all, all along the way. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the wonderful students from Iroquois High School, and you can just see why you know, this forum would not be complete without having their voices, uh, their, uh, their, their perspectives, their presence. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, let's follow up a little bit about what they had to offer from us, because you saw part of their presentation included the word sustainability. Now, one of the things I've observed, and I've been teaching MBA students for a long time, I was mentioning this to Ken, and I'd like to hear you all 
talk about what you've observed as well. As we're starting to tell this new story, this new human story about where we are, I've found that over the last 15 to 20 years that my MBA students almost always, and I teach a course called, course called Managing in the Future, they are always bringing up now notions of sustainability and uh, the, the discussions about climate change. And I, I'm wondering whether or not you have noticed something too from a generational cha uh, change. Any, anyone can start there. What have you noticed? Well, I mean, I think this is the, uh, you asked me, I think the first question was, why am I optimistic? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. To the extent that I am optimistic, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do you still oh, are there. I am. <laughs> a lot of it has to do. I want to clarify here. A lot of it has to do with the energy of the youth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the last six to eight months, um, it has really started to flex its muscles. Um, the uh, sunrise movement that's mm -hmm. pushing the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Right. Excellent. That is such an inspiring frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the moral demand that young people are making of their parents mm -hmm. to do something about this problem and not leave behind uh, a world that's, that's worse for them than what we've enjoyed is, is an absolutely irrefutable mm -hmm. moral demand. So I'm extremely excited about this activism that's really springing up all over the world. And I believe here in the United States that this is going to make climate change if not the issue of the 2020 election, mm -hmm. one of two or three. And mm -hmm. that is huge progress huge. because I don't know if everyone remembers, four years ago, mm -hmm. it barely registered. Mm -hmm. There were three presidential debates. Mm -hmm. The words climate change, I don't even think were spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, that's never gonna happen now. And we have uh, largely the youth of this country to thank mm -hmm. for demanding that this issue be attended to. So I'm very excited, I'm really excited to see uh, all these high schools and others Absolutely. here today. It's another ratification that you're, you're looking at the future, you're looking at the planet, you're looking at the world ahead, and you are absolutely right to demand that we make the world sustainable for you. So thank you. <laughs> Catherine? I, I want to point to what I see as a growing, not just not just uh, acknowledgement of diversity of life forms, mm -hmm. but a welcoming and embrace and hospitality and encouragement of diversity, mm -hmm. um, of kinds of human beings, but of kinds of other, uh, other species as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. The fact that we are interdependent, that mm -hmm. one kind of human being is not normative, mm -hmm. that one species is not necessarily mm -hmm normative or excessively privileged. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a revolution that is ongoing mm -hmm. uh, in the way we approach the world. Now, where are you seeing this? I, I think I, I have an idea, but explore that a little bit. You, you're, you're stretching out boundaries here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where are you seeing this? Uh, and, and how did you come to see it the way that you're seeing it now? The idea that we're expanding our notions of humanity, species, the appreciation. I could get it in terms of, you know, wanting to have um, set aside places for certain species to live, but you, you're talking about something else. You're talking about consciousness, aren't you? Yeah, yes. Um, if you look at the history of human beings on this patch of land mm -hmm. that we call the United States, mm -hmm. uh, indigenous people were here first mm -hmm. um, and have a much I think greater understanding of interconnectedness, mm -hmm. the sacred hoop, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the constellation of beings that live and thrive mm -hmm. in a particular context. Mm -hmm. that's, that's as far back as I can look on this geography. Mm -hmm. But when Euro-Americans settled here, um, when the United States began to emerge, um, who was privileged? white men over the age of 21 who owned land mm -hmm. were the only ones who counted um, democratically, right? Mm -hmm. um, we began to expand our consciousness about what kinds of human beings mm -hmm. were permitted to make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, 
We emancipated slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, we gave black men the vote. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, not for long, mm -hmm. but we tried. Mm -hmm. um, women eventually got the vote. Mm -hmm. Eventually we began to realize that children had rights. Mm -hmm. um, we're beginning to recognize that other species mm -hmm. need to be encouraged mm -hmm. to thrive mm -hmm. or we will not long survive. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a trajectory, it's the moral arc, uh, mm -hmm. reaching toward greater justice mm -hmm. for all life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's so many threads to pick up here, but just to uh, bounce off Catherine's, um, Aldo Leopold was a great environmentalist who graduated from our School of uh, Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale, and he said we didn't give rights just along the lines that Catherine has said to mm -hmm. minorities and women, so we've made progress there, but we must create a land ethic. Yeah. And he did this in his beautiful book, um, The Sand County Almanac. It's absolutely, he has the science and he has the poetry. Mm -hmm. And it's so powerful, I highly recommend that. Um, and, and others have had this sense, Muir, and many of our early mm -hmm. environmentalists, mm -hmm. about the beauty of nature um, and its call to us. But from a land ethic, we're moving to a global ethics, and that's why the Earth Charter is so important. And even in that trajectory, um, we've come a very long way mm -hmm. in, in a very short period of time. I was saying last night, my grandfather tried to get the history department at Columbia to move from American history to European history. His student moved it to Asian studies. They've got fabulous Asian studies at Columbia and other universities now. And then world history came into being, and I was part of this learning trajectory. And then we've got big history and a journey of the universe. That's in two generations mm -hmm. where our sense of ourselves has really um, expanded. Just briefly, I want to say that's not without struggle, mm -hmm. that's not right. without imperfections, mm -hmm. but without aspiration, we won't have a realization. And I can tell you, Yale is going through huge struggles with this mm -hmm. to be much more inclusive and, um, and to recognize the racist parts of environmentalism, mm -hmm. um, even moving people off of land and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But, Along these lines, I think this, this arc of justice is moving, and my greatest hope is our students who are just amazing, like you young people here. Yeah. Well, um, let's, let's do a, a little bit tougher part of our last discussion, which is talking about interdependence and uh, independence. We have these two poles that, that have been our history of our of our, ever since we could draw maps, we've, right. we've had one or the other. So, but now science and what you all three of you have been talking about is that as a species, we are writing a new story, mm -hmm. the Anthropocene, mm -hmm. we are writing a new story. Now, a little bit about, talk a little bit about the real hard challenge of what happens when nations decide to go inside versus mm -hmm. outside. And it seems to me that when you look at the populist movements around the world, yeah. and, and we have a history yeah. of, of taking our eye off these larger pictures. We've been in awe of the universe before. Mm -hmm. So now, I, we've been optimistic before. Do a little bit about how are we going to solve for this, Ken? You <laughs> I was hoping I'd go third so I could time, time to think of your question. That is a, a very, very prescient question, um, and, and it, it is no uh, accident that the same, and I'm sorry to be a little political here, but yeah, the same sure. president who mm -hmm. wants to pull us out of the Paris Agreement mm -hmm. also is, uh, you know, raising issues about NATO, raising issues about trade, uh, immigration, uh, and the like, that's all related. And, and I do very much fear that this is a trend mm -hmm. that's spreading. Mm -hmm. um, we have a president now in Brazil who's talking about mm -hmm. pulling Brazil mm -hmm. out uh, of the Paris Agreement. And, and of course, Brazil has done a relatively admirable job in recent years mm -hmm. of protecting the rainforest. And that is a vital world resource for all of us to deal with things like climate change. So. This is a, uh, an enormous problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think the roots of it, as best as I can understand, 
are the economic dislocation right. that people are feeling from the global economy. Mm -hmm. And the reason, part of the reason they're feeling this is because we do not do a good job in a capitalist economy of taking care of the people who aren't prospering. Mm -hmm. And that's why economic justice and yeah, climate absolutely. justice are so integrally related. And so I, I would like to see the United States look at change and trade and uh, uh, leadership on climate change all as actual benefits, mm -hmm. not harms, things mm -hmm. that will help us. But in order to do that, we have to have an answer to the coal miner who's mm -hmm. going to yeah, lose absolutely. his or her job. Absolutely. Um, and until we do that, um, they have a plausible case that this is all bad and they want to go back to the right. mythical days of the 1950s, which didn't really exist, but in their minds they do. And, and, and that's what's happening globally. And, and so it, it really, it, that interdependence thing really mm -hmm. comes out. If you want to solve climate change, you have to solve the issue of economic justice. Absolutely. It's all related. Those two things related. Yes. Um, Catherine, you, uh, or Mary Ellen, would you add anything because we're going to have the students to come up here in just a moment? S something, something brief. Um, Rabbi Edwin Friedman taught people who deal with family systems a great deal about anxiety and resistance. Uh, he said when the, when the pushback gets the hardest, uh, when the isolationism gets most intense, uh, that means you're having an effect a positive effect. So it, it is cause for hope to see um, both the, the desire to focus only inward and on mm. ourselves to be selfish, but the response that's happening among um, climate activists mm. around the world is a sign that um, change is coming. Mm -hmm. Change is coming. Mm -hmm. um, it's painful, but it's happening. Good. And just very briefly, um, thank you. My grandfather's last book was Nationalism or Religion, and that's why he was trying to move the history, understanding of history. We have not told our history. We grew up in an apartheid country. We grew up in a country that almost had genocide with Native Americans and so on. We are now telling our history, and that is why it is so important. It's not just looking at the past. It's to reconstruct the present. We must retell our history. It will be great struggles. We had to change the name at Yale of Calhoun, of one of the colleges, and it was struggle. The president said, no problem. The student said, it's a problem. He was a slave owner. Mm -hmm. But why I think it's so important to have the big story, the journey of the universe, to contain the fact that all of life mm -hmm. in this 14 billion year process, universe, earth, and human, it's energy going forward, entropy going backward. We're in this creativity and <laughs> loss. Mm -hmm. It's, it's part of the way the universe works, and that gives us hope for change against tremendous odds. And I want to make my final thanks, and let's clap for the young people here and around the world. Amen. <laughs>
And again, it's not going to be solved easily, but it's where Earth Charter, ecological integrity, social economic justice, democracy, nonviolence, and peace, and most of all, we've got to make sure the democratic institutions that are still <laughs> emerging here and around the world are going to ensure justice for our neighbors to the south and elsewhere and around the world and what they are suffering. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that de <laughs> democracy. Hello, my name is Clement Oyemungu. I was um, born and raised in Africa, a continent that has some of the most impoverished countries in the world. Last month, the continent was, was hit with a devastating cyclone that killed many people mm -hmm. and damaged many buildings and homes. My question for you today is, what are some of the roots of, what are some root, what are some of the root causes of natural disasters such as cyclones in relation to climate change? And what are some tools that the younger generation could use to prevent future environmental crisis? I'm, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm struck by the connection between the passion that arose around the world at the turn of the millennium around the Millennium Development Goals, mm -hmm. about seeking solutions to the worst of the world's poverty and asking every developed nation to contribute seven-tenths of a percent of their GDP. We're talking in this era about the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the possibility of 1% um, right. income tax, basically, to respond to the devastation that's causing those extreme mm -hmm. storms. Um, we could do it. Mm -hmm. It only takes the political right. human yeah. will mm -hmm. to act. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, I would just add the following. I, I, the science is getting clearer and clearer in linking these extreme weather events to climate change. Climate change both increases the odds of them happening and the severity once they do happen. And that um, is, is very, very strong science. Uh, one of the things that I'm encouraged about as I learn about Africa um, is it does have this opportunity uh, to really build a grid that's based on renewable energy as opposed to taking a grid that was based on fossil fuel energy and, and converting it. Um, I've, I've read a number of stories now about how solar energy is now the cheapest uh, source of energy um, in Africa, and I think there is this opportunity. But uh, I think the most important thing here when we talk about climate change is to recognize that the developed world is responsible for the vast uh, majority of the carbon emissions that are in the atmosphere now. And if we want developing countries in Africa that are gaining population, that are in starting to enjoy economic growth, that want cars, that want electricity, uh, we, we, we can't expect them to accept a lower standard of living Absolutely. than we have to Absolutely. deal with the issue of climate change. And so uh, I think we have both a moral obligation to help fund clean energy in African countries and I think uh, as a country with technological innovation, it will be in our interest to do so. Uh, these are the growing economies of the world. We want them to be our customers. So I think there is both a moral case and an economic case to really link arms with the very fast growing countries in Africa that um, can be really a big part of the climate solution. Thank you.